Luna Park Sydney is one of the oldest amusement parks in all of Australia. This park has been around for nearly a century, but it has undergone facelift after facelift. The park has survived multiple closures, and the ride lineup has changed mightily over the years, most recently with a $30 million renovation just two years ago. Was this ultimately worth it? Find out in this review of Luna Park Sydney. This park's story begins with the Sydney Harbour Bridge. This is a 3,770 foot or 1,149 meter long steel arch bridge spanning across the harbour. It opened way back in 1932 after a decade of construction. This was a massive undertaking and it required workshops, cranes and railway slidings at the base of the bridge, but these were no longer needed upon its completion, so the city took bids for the site. One bid came from the owners of Luna Park Glenelg, an amusement park in southern Australia that had just opened in 1930. However, the owners were having difficulties with the Glenelg Council and the city residents, so they sought a second location. They got it with Luna Park Sydney, which opened in 1935. Many of the original rides actually came from Luna Park Glenelg, which closed in 1934 due to the ongoing issues with the town. Luna Park thrived from 1935 until the late 1960s. In 1970, the original owners sold the park to World Trade Center, who tried to demolish the park and replace it with a series of high-rise buildings. But the local government rejected this plan, and Luna Park remained as an amusement park. But dark days were ahead. In 1979, the park's ghost train dark ride tragically caught fire. Seven people passed away, and the park was immediately shut down. Shortly thereafter, the park's classic Big Dipper wood coaster was demolished. The park was acquired by Australian Amusement Associates and reopened as Harborside Amusement Park in 1982. But public interest was minimal. The park had basic carnival rides, and the park closed in 1988 after multiple inspectors found maintenance violations. During its closure, the Luna Park Reserve Trust was formed, making it one of two parks in the world, along with Tivoli Gardens, that are protected by government legislation. This meant the site would always be an amusement park, but they just needed to reopen it. It reopened again in 1995, this time as Luna Park. The anchor attraction would be an even bigger Big Dipper than before. This arrow looping coaster would open as the tallest and fastest coaster in all of Australia. The park's future rested in this ride, but was met with opposition from day one. If you're unfamiliar with Luna Park, you should know the park borders multiple apartment buildings, and most residents are not exactly coaster enthusiasts. The EPA approved Big Dipper's construction, but they placed the park under strict noise limits. There were a series of times the coaster could not operate. That was bad enough, but locals sought injunctions to stop the ride from operating entirely. This doomed the ride in the park, causing it to close in 1996. Luna Park and Big Dipper reopened for special days in 2000 and 2001. These include the Sydney Olympics, select weekends, and school holidays. But this was only temporary and the park once again closed. It was redeveloped once again, reopening in 2004. Fortunately, the park has been fairly stable ever since. Over the past two decades, it is only closed for the COVID-19 pandemic, like many parks across the world, and for its most recent renovation. In 2021, Luna Park commissioned a $30 million upgrade. This included nine new rides, including three roller coasters, one of which would be a prototype Intamin single rail coaster named Big Dipper in honor of the two coasters that came before it. My one visit took place in 2023 after this upgrade was completed, and it breathed new life into the park. Many of the new rides were among the most popular attractions in the park the day I visited, and they look great too. These rides are bright and colorful. This contrasts nicely with the older rides and architecture. The park has some stunning buildings in the front half. I love the facades on the Coney Island Funhouse and the Wild Mouse Coaster as well. Then you have the iconic entry archway. It is a giant smiling face affixed to Art Deco towers. It is a work of art. Luna Park doesn't have much in terms of theming, but that's fine because the place is very well maintained and it just has that classic amusement park vibe to it. Plus this park has some stunning sight lines because of its unique location. The park is at the bottom of a cliff filled with skyscrapers. That alone is neat, but the other side goes right up against Sydney Harbour. The park has some piers that go right up next to the water, 
so you get one of the best views of the bridge from many points in the park, particularly from the park's tallest attractions. It is such a cool backdrop for an amusement park. This location also makes the park highly accessible from anywhere within Sydney. The best way to reach the park is by boat. You pass right under the bridge and get a great skyline shot of Luna Park as you approach it. Ferries run every few minutes from Darling Harbour and or Circular Quay all the way to Milson's Wharf, which is just a one minute walk from the main entrance. Alternatively, you can access the park by train. The Milson's Point train station is roughly a five minute walk from the main entrance. The one method I'd advise against is driving a car. Luna Park is a modest sized parking lot, but it is very pricey. It costs roughly $10 per hour and maxes out at $50 for the day. Meanwhile, the public transit options I mentioned cost roughly $5 each way from downtown Sydney. Luna Park is free to enter. Most parks of the setup offer guests the option to purchase tickets if they only want to ride a few attractions, or a wristband if they want to ride many attractions. Luna Park oddly only offers a wristband, so it is all or nothing. Wristbands can cost as little as $44 if you buy in advance on the right day, but they can cost you $75 the day of. It's pretty pricey when you look at the ride lineup, but it's not too surprising for a park located in a bustling metropolis area. Luna Park is open year-round, but it is not open daily. Compare that to the parks on the Gold Coast that are open almost every single day. Luna Park is consistently open Friday through Sunday. They offer additional weekdays during school holidays. Then the park's hours can vary mightily by the time of year. The park can close as early as 3 p.m. or stay open as late as 10 p.m. The late closures are more likely on weekends around school holidays. And let me tell you, this park has some really nice looking lights once the sun goes down. As for how much time you'll need, I think you can comfortably experience everything this park has to offer in 4 or so hours. If you only care about the coasters, you probably only need half that time. But this is a park where I strongly recommend checking out the non-coasters too. These are some of the park's best rides to be honest. The park is fairly easy to navigate. Luna Park is very narrow because of the aforementioned setting. You have one midway servicing the entire park. The only weird thing about it is that you need to take this ramp underneath the funhouse to access the back section. This is where you'll find most of the park's kiddie rides. There are also lockers back here, and a staircase serving as a back entrance bringing you up to street level. Or you can use the staircase to get sweet views of Big Dipper like most coaster enthusiasts tend to do. I don't believe this park is typically too crowded. Heck, my visit took place on a holiday weekend, and nothing was more than a 5-10 to 10 minute wait. But both Big Dipper and Sledgehammer have a ton of queue space, and the latter has signs estimating the wait at different points, all the way up to an hour, suggesting the park can sometimes get busy. If it does get busy, keep in mind there are no skip the line passes here. Operations were a mixed bag. Staff members, like most parks in Australia, were super friendly. On the downside, some thrill rides loaded very slowly due to strict loose article policies. The biggest offender was Sledgehammer. Like many rides in Australia, you cannot bring anything with you. This even included glasses with a strap and items in zippered pockets. Everything must be stored on the ride platform. But I do want to shout out the crew at Big Dipper. They had the fastest dispatches of any coaster in Australia by far. That ride was only running one train that sat just seven people, yet the line moved at a steady pace because of their efforts. Luna Park is good about listing their daily ride closures both at the main ticket booth and on the website. However, they do not list their maintenance schedule in advance. It's understandable a year-round park will have to close rides time and time again, but I wish they could post these dates in advance like the parks on the Gold Coast do so people could plan in advance. Now let's jump into the ride lineup. There are less than 20 rides here, but they do cover most main genres. There are two noticeable gaps though. First, the park lacks a traditional dark ride. I'm guessing that may be related to the ghost train incident back in the 1970s. Second, the park does not have any water rides for those hot summer days. As for the rides they do have, they currently have four different roller coasters. The most thrilling coaster here is probably Big Dipper the prototype intimate hot racer. The key with this ride is to go in with the right expectations. RMC's single rail coasters are among the most intense coaster experiences out there. Big Dipper is much more of a family thrill coaster. That being said, the second half is good. 
you have a punchy tire driven launch followed by a forceful turnaround comprised of a non inverting loop and a reverse sidewinder back to back. You then have the ride's one airtime hill, and a final section is quite dizzying with the constant directional changes. The ride does have a very noticeable rattle further back in the train, but as I said in my review, it is a solid top coaster for this park. Unfortunately, I missed the park's classic wooden wild mouse in my visit because it was closed for track work. This is the second time I saw one of these old mice closed in person. It's a shame because I've heard the airtime on the wooden wild mice in the second half is pretty freaky. Combine that with the usually strong laterals and visuals on the hairpin turns, and this ride was a dark horse candidate to be the best ride at the park. Boomerang is a Gerslauer family boomerang. This was another one closed for maintenance, but I have ridden an exact clone in Rewind Racers at Adventure City. This is a smooth ride comparable to the family shuttle coasters made by Vacoma. The drops are fine, but the highlight is the backwards helix. It has some nice force for a ride of this size. Lastly, you have Little Nipper. This is a little kiddie coaster from Preston and Barbieri. It consists of a single downward spiral, but it's comfortable enough for all ages and I love how the name sort of plays on the park's signature coaster. And oddly enough, you will find more merchandise for the kiddie coaster than you will for Big Dipper. While on the topic of kiddie rides, there are a half dozen over by Little Nipper. They make up a large chunk of the Luna Land area, so kids can easily bounce from ride to ride. Luna Park is a handful of notable flat rides, and the most thrilling of the bunch is oddly placed among the kiddie rides. This is none other than Sledgehammer. This is an inverting frisbee from Zamperla. The standard program has incredible hang time over the top, paired with a unique view of the area. Then the downswings contrast that with decent positive Gs. And a neat thing about this ride is that they offer two programs. When you enter the queue, you can select if you want the 360 degree version that fully inverts you over the top, or the 240 degree version that does not go upside down, it just rocks back and forth. A few rides in Australia allow you to pick if you want a wild or mild ride. Another attraction doing this at the park is the Himalaya and Tango Train. Built by SBF Visa, the wild version is one of the best versions of this type of ride out there. It goes so fast. You get strong laterals and it's fast enough to give small pops of airtime, especially because there are no seatbelts. But the park's best spinning ride is Rotor. This is a classic flat ride putting you in a small drum that rotates at a whopping 33 RPMs. You are pinned against the wall, making your stomach feel funny from the forces. The intensity feels similar to Canopy's Turkish twist. Then the floor drops out a long ways beneath you for a neat visual. And unlike most rides like this, this one actually is a long and satisfying cycle. Make sure you have an iron stomach if you go on this one. Then the park's tallest rides offer great views. If you like extreme rides, do not miss Hair Razor. This is a 14 story tall drop tower from ARM or Larson. You slowly climb to the top, getting a chance to take in the sights. Then you drop like a rock with no warning. You get better airtime than most drop towers, floating the entire way down and the plunge is downright gut-wrenching. Between the power and views, this is one of the best drop towers out there, and it ended up being my favorite ride at the park. If you want to take everything in a more leisurely pace, you have the 13-story tall ferris wheel. Because of its placement, I think it gives some of the best views of the harbor. Honestly, I think it beat the view you get from the Sydney Tower Eye. Then you have a few additional spinning rides to round out the flat ride lineup. The final attraction should not be missed is Coney Island. This is a giant funhouse. Rather than being a single linear path like most of them, this is a big open space with a series of standalone attractions. You have some tall and fast wooden slides. Some can offer little bits of airtime from the humps. While the Devil's Drop is downright terrifying, you have a near vertical plunge offering a similar thrill to the big speed slides at water parks. Then you have the Joy Wheel. This is a spinning wheel where guests sit back to back. You then fight the centripetal forces to see who can stay on the longest. It's not as fast as the ones I experienced in Germany, but you cannot use your hand so it's pretty tricky, and it's quite funny either wiping out or watching others crash into the pads on the side. But that's not all. Coney Island also has a spinning barrel, some crazy platforms called a turkey trot, and a decent mirror maze tucked beneath the slides. There are also a lot of older arcade games, but unfortunately, 
most if not all of them appear to be broken. The park does not have much in terms of live entertainment, as you do not have a dedicated stage, but you may see some performers singing and dancing on the midway at set points of the day. The park does have a lot of carnival games though, including a few weird ones I had not seen before. Lastly, let's talk about the food. The snacks here are good, my wife loved the gelato, and my soft pretzel was solid, but the entrees are disappointing. They are very pricey, and we didn't think the quality was anywhere close to the price. If you're hungry, I would honestly recommend leaving the park for an hour to get food and come back. So do I recommend Luna Park? Yes I do. This is a fun little park located in the heart of Sydney. While the park may not have as much quantity as some parks with more land, this park has a delightful blend of attractions. You have some modern thrill rides from the recent expansion like Big Dipper. Then you have some unique classics like the Fun House and some older flat rides too. And don't forget about the park setting. That is a big part of the experience. The biggest con with this park is its price. But you're in a big tourist area so it's not unexpected, it's just a reality. But I think you'll have a lot of fun if you give this park a shot between the views and attractions. So those are my thoughts on Luna Park Sydney. What are your thoughts on this place? Let me know what you think of the park, especially if you saw it before and after the renovation down below. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like, and you considered subscribing, because there'll be a lot more roller coaster and amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.